Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word, this book of Leviticus. Uh, in our last lecture, we ended with chapter 16, which was uh, covering the Day of Atonement and reminding you one more time, we, we don't go through any of that for expiating or atoning our sins now. We, we let that blood on the cross of Jesus Christ cover our sins today. Be sure you wash your your sins in that blood. That's all you will ever need. Now chapters 17 through 20, uh, we come through a set of what I would call ceremonial laws, and it's uh, most, for the most part, they concern the conduct uh, of the part of the people. And uh, remember this whole book, God calling Israel to be holy because he was holy. And uh, the purpose of the book in a nutshell was to teach Israel how they they could worship him. Uh, in chapter 17, breaking it down in verses 1 through 9, the whole chapter deals with uh, offerings and their requirements as far as the sacrifices are concerned. Uh, the appointed place we'll be covering in verses 1 through 9, and then from verse 10 through the remainder of the book uh, concerns appointed foods that Israel is to eat and some that they're prohibited from. I'm eating. So with that, we'll ask a, a word of wisdom in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Chapter 17, the book of Leviticus, verse 1, and it reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Verse 2, speak unto Aaron, meaning the priest, uh, Aaron the, the high priest representing the priesthood, and to his sons, and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying, uh, what we're going to be covering is concerning the offerings and sacrifices, specifically where those are to take place. Uh, many scholars, there's a, a great deal of uh, argument among commentators, scholars about what the next few verses talk about, whether it's speaking specifically uh, about sacrifices, or is it speaking about all animals slaughtered uh, for the purpose of eating? Uh, more on that in a moment. <clears throat> Verse 3. What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or lamb or goat in the camp or that killeth it out of the camp, and here we see where the argument starts. Um, the word killeth here uh, actually is not the word zabak in the word in Hebrew, which we normally see of the word sacrifice, and it means to slay. Um, um, those of you with companion Bibles, uh, you'll note that you have a, 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 a my Bullinger in, in the uh, side column that the word killeth, it's necessary due to the ellipsis that it's necessary to supply, that, that this means, that you supply the ellipsis, I should say, meaning that this means in sacrifice. And there's several, what does ellipsis mean? Ellipsis means that there's either a word or a phrase missing but the rest of the context makes it very clear what we're talking about. Uh, a couple things that I note here, we have the ox, the lamb, and the goat. What are the sacrificial animals? The ox, the lamb, and the goat uh, uh, being acceptable sacrifices. So I disagree with the scholars and commentators that say this is pertaining to all animals killed for the purpose of eating and pertaining 
pertains only to those that are offered to the Lord. And another thing that they point out, the those that are, have the opposing view of what I just stated, or, or notice the last phrase in that verse, or that killeth it out of the camp. This mean that what this means is that normally before this law was given, they might have killed it outside the camp. Not anymore, as we'll see in the next few verses. Verse 4, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord. Blood shall be imputed unto that man. That's to say he is guilty of blood shedding. Uh, in other words, murder, uh, punishment, extermination. He hath shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. And that, again, meaning extermination. Now, that's pretty severe, and the severity is going to be explained in the next few verses. And what was going on at this time was that the altar of God was not the only altar in the area. There were all kinds of other altars to other gods. The whole purpose of this law, which will be stating that the people of Israel, if they're going to offer a sacrifice, they're going to do it to Yahweh, and that will be at, for this time period anyway, the only acceptable location will be at the tabernacle. Verse 5, to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices. Here we go. That's the Hebrew word zebach. Now we're getting down to where we know what the subject is. And again, the content here uh, makes it very clear to me that we're talking about sacrifices, not every animal slain for the purpose of eating which they offer in the open field, again, would have, before this law, offered in the open field, even that they may bring them unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, and offer them for peace offerings unto the Lord. And the peace offerings in the Hebrew being shalem, close to a word many of you are very familiar with, shalom in the Hebrew, meaning, of course, peace, and the shalem being the peace offering. Again, we see here the tabernacle established as the only place, for this time being at least, uh, that one may offer. Now, this law uh, will be amended in Deuteronomy chapter 12. I'll we'll start reading along about verse 13 in the following following verses, and you'll see that once Israel was to enter the promised land, that no longer would they have to bring their sacrifices all the way to the tabernacle, which uh, of course started out to uh, several uh, places, locations, uh, and eventually winding up at the temple in Jerusalem, as most of you know, but uh, God made it possible at a point that they could take their burnt offerings to a place that he would designate within each of the 12 tribes. It would have been you know, a considerable journey and quite a bit of a, a, a effort going into the means of travel. You know, they couldn't jump in their car and uh, drive 70, 75 miles an hour and, and get there as quickly as we can. It uh, required either walking by foot and bringing your sacrifice with you, or perhaps if you were wealthy, having uh, donkeys or, or carts, etc. Verse 6, and the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord, just as prescribed in chapter 3, verse 2, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And again, there were other altars than the altar of the Lord. Um, at this point, we're going to be going into the fact that the people uh, were at this time making sacrifices to devils. Uh, I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, just for a few verses, just hold your place there. Deuteronomy 32, of course, being the song of Moses, uh, that song that those that overcome the Antichrist will be singing as written in uh, Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. And 
of course, we find that it is the song of Moses in verse 30 of chapter 31, which where you find the title, but we're going to pick it up in Deuteronomy 32, verse 15. Again, this is the song that the people that overcome Antichrist in the future will be singing uh, as they are uh, uh, celebrating the fact that they didn't bow a knee to Baal or, or to Antichrist, if you will. Verse 15, but Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Jeshurun is a pet name that God gave to Israel when they're fat, dumb, and happy. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he, this being Jeshurun, Israel, forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed, check out this word is nabail, lightly esteemed, and it means to fall away, apostatize in other words. The rock of his salvation, notice the capital R, um, that is our rock, Jesus Christ, verse 16. They provoked him, this is, continues about Jeshurun, Israel, when they've got it too good. They provoked him to, to jealousy, with strange gods, with abominations. And in Matthew chapter 24 and Daniel chapter 9, we learn about the abomination of desolation, that being Antichrist uh, standing where he ought not in the holy place, uh, even that abomination. Provoke they him to anger. Exodus 34, verse 14, uh, our God's name is Jealous. That's his name is Jealous. 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Why didn't their fathers revere them? Because they didn't even exist. They made up new religions. And what God is trying to get across through this, these laws through in chapter 17 through 20 is don't do as the Egyptians did from whence you came out of captivity and don't do as the Canaanites are doing now in the land that I'm taking you to, the promised land. Well, you don't understand, Pastor Murray. There's, you know, we we in our churches we don't we don't make sacrifices to devils. We don't have new religions. Oh, what about when you roll your Easter eggs to Ishtar, from which the word comes, a Phoenician goddess, Astarte, into the uh, Assyrians. That's not of God. If you look up Easter in any Webster's Dictionary, College Webster's Dictionary, 7th edition or earlier, you'll see that Ishtar, Easter, is a, of a pagan holiday. So nothing new under the sun. And that is why uh, God's elect, those that overcome Antichrist, will be singing that song of Moses, pointing out to Jeshurun where they went wrong. And that is in their making up new religions when the only religion we need is found right here in God's word. Verse 7, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. God knew that they were doing it at the time. Uh, this word devils in the Hebrew is sa'ir. Uh, you know what it is? It's a he-goat, a goat after whom they have gone a-whoring. My words? No, this is the Lord's word. That's just exactly. He has emotions. When his children worship gods other than himself, he gets jealous, and he looks upon their actions as going whoring after other gods. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. Now, according to Josephus, who is a uh, religious historian, I guess would be a, a good way to term who he was. Was he an author of one of the books of the Bible with God uh, guiding his hand? No, he wasn't, but he, he was, he's a well-known historian. Uh, according to Josephus, this devil that's being referred to here was one of the gods of the Egyptians, and Israel had gone a-whoring by worship 
worshiping him while they were in captivity. You see, at this time, they had just been out of captivity for just almost exactly a year from the Exodus. And this uh, Egyptian god named Pan, called Pan by many, the Egyptians actually called him Mendez, uh, personified uh, the male and fertilization in nature. Uh, he was half goat, half man type being. Uh, and from this actually come many things that you're probably familiar with today. Uh, the satyrs, uh, which were uh, you know half goat, half man. The fawns of Roman mythology, which were uh, had the ears of a goat, the tail of a goat uh, on a man's body, and then later even the hind legs. Uh, the woodland uh, deities of the Greeks come from this, partially goat, partially man. And believe it or not, even the Christian's own description of the devil parts of it come from this. You ever wonder where the, the devil got those uh, horns on his head? The old billy goat. How about that tail and the hooves? They come directly from this pan of a uh, goat god. I guess uh, we Christians over the years added the red flannel underwear and the pitchfork just to throw in a little bit of color to be a little different. I, I don't know. Of course, he's not going to look like a goat. He's not going to look like what we picture, the many Christians, unfortunately, picture as the devil. He's going to look like you think Jesus Christ should look. Why? He wants you to think that he is Jesus. Verse 8. And thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers which sojourn among you, in other words, any foreigners that are living among the Israelites, that offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice, again, trying to uh, keep the practices of the heathen religions from rubbing off on the Israelites. Verse 9, And bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of, con of the congregation to offer it unto the Lord, that Yahweh. In other words, you make your sacrifices to Yahweh and Yahweh alone. There, there are no other gods. Even that man shall be cut off from among his people. Uh, extermination. A pretty stiff penalty. Well, God was serious. And unfortunately, down through the centuries, uh, some of the uh, higher thought of king, Solomon, the wisest uh, king of, of all time. Why? Because God gave him his wisdom. But in his latter years, uh, he fell into idolatry. Had over 600 wives and concubines and was bringing them in from all over the world, strange women, and building altars on the hillside around Jerusalem for them to worship their gods, and he even joined in with them. Verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, and now we move into the uh, appointed foods and prohibitions, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I, Lord speaking, will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood. This set my face against could be what its meaning is. That is to say, I will judge. And if anyone would know, he would know. And will cut him off from among his people. And animals that are slaughtered to be eaten must be properly bled. Uh, this does not necessarily mean that you are to become a vegetarian, that any amount of blood is not to be eaten. What this means is that when an animal is sacrificed, that uh, and anyone raised on a farm knows that when you slaughter an animal to be eaten, it must be properly bled. Hunters that hunt game know that you must bleed it after killing. And why? Well, the meat will putrefy very quickly if you don't. And God also has some other reasons that we're about to learn about why you don't eat the blood. And drinking blood was a common Common practice of the heathen as well. Uh, warriors felt like that if they uh, drank the blood of a powerful animal that they somehow would inherit uh, those characteristics of that animal and, and make them better warriors in other words. Verse 11, for the life, and this word in the Hebrew is nefesh, one you're very familiar with many of you, which means soul of the flesh is in the blood. 
and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. God selected blood to be the, um, the vehicle by which man could obtain atonement and expiate his sins. At this time, it was in the blood of those animals that were sacrificed. Obviously, today, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that makes atonement for those who believe uh, on him and repent and obtain forgiveness. Verse 12. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Verse 13. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, and notice the same laws that apply to Israel apply to foreigners who are living among the Israelites. Don't, don't let it creep into your society is the point. Which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, in other words, it's clean, animal as we learned in, in chapter 11, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it in the, with dust. And some think that this means to prevent uh, desecration of the blood in that God chose that blood uh, to be, if you will, the soul of the flesh. Now don't misunderstand, this is talking about the soul of the flesh, not your eternal soul, so to speak. Uh, uh, the blood Blood, which carries oxygen and nutrients to your flesh body, you can see how it could be defined as the soul of the flesh, but don't get spiritual and physical mixed up here. Verse 14, for it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. In other words, exterminated. Verse 15. And every soul that eateth that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beasts, and in Exodus 22:31, it's established that an animal that is torn by beast should be thrown to the dogs. Whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even, then shall he be clean. And why is this prohibition? Well, an animal that dies of itself or is torn is possibly doesn't meet the two conditions here. It's not uh, uh, properly uh, bled after it was killed, therefore it could putrefy very quickly. Uh, the second reason, would be that possibly the animal was diseased and that's what caused him to die. Uh, not uh, punishable by being cut off, but certainly defiling the person that partook of it. Um, also in Deuteronomy chapter 14, 21, we learn that if you come across an animal that died in itself or is torn of uh, beasts of prey, for example, that it's all right to sell or give the flesh to uh, a stranger, but it certainly would not be allowable to a stranger that was sojourning or dwelling among the children of Israel. Verse 16. But if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. To bear one's iniquity always means that God will choose the punishment, and it can range uh, anywhere from being struck with an illness or a plague uh, to remaining childless all your life or uh, possibly even extermination, in other words, to die. <clears throat> now we come to chapter 18. And what we'll find here is the prohibition against incest. And many would say, well, you mean incest wasn't against the law to, from the get-go? No, it wasn't. This law was, is being established right here. In no previous chapter of the previous two books of the Bible do we have the law of incest. Well. Do you, mean, do you mean to say that that meant it's all right for Adam's and Eve's sons and daughters 
to lay with each other and, and produce children. That's what God's Word is all about. And He wanted that, that seed line from Adam uh, and Eve to be kept pure all the way down, as it's written in the first prophecy in the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, uh, where God is talking to Satan, the, the serpent, and his role as the serpent. And He talks to, you know, to the uh, serpent and He says, uh, what you, for what you've done, uh, I'm going to put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. That means I'm going to keep them apart. And you will bruise his heel, which they did, he and his, with Christ on the cross when they drove the spikes through his heels. But it, meaning he, Christ, will bruise thy head. That bruising is yet to come. I look forward to the day. I hope I get to witness it. Chapter 18, dealing with the prohibition against incest. Again, subject matter be a little bit on the mature side. Uh, if you're not certain, if you're watching with a younger viewer, you might want to record the program watch it later yourself and see if there are any issues that you're not quite ready to discuss with the youngsters yet. And that's understandable if that's the case. Chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. That same I am that when Moses went up on the mountain the first time, Mount Sinai, and God spoke with him there and said, this is what's going to do here and this is what you're going to do there. Now go down and tell the, the, my children, the children of Israel, what's going on. And Moses said, wait a minute, you know, who should I say sent me? And he said, I am that I am. And that's what he meant and that's what he is. That means he has always been, he can be anything, anytime, any place that he wants to be. And notice the uh, this chapter begins with I am and also ends with I am, adding uh, a special emphasis, if you will. And I think the I am occurs four other times in between the beginning and the end. Verse 3, after the doings of the land of Egypt, these, this word doings means abominable, abominable practices in the original language, wherein ye dwelt, in other words, you just came from there, shall ye not do. And after the doings, the abominable practices of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances, or maybe better translated statutes. Now, this prohibition of incest, and we'll also see in the uh, latter verses of this chapter, again, just to sensual or carnal abominations are introduced also, but the warning, as we just saw, against the customs of the Egyptians and the Canaanites. Verse 4. Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Again, keep track of the I am. So he's, he's laying it out in, with emphasis here. I don't want you doing like the Egyptians and the Canaanites or the land you're going into. Uh, you're going to do my judgments and my ordinances. Why? Because I am the Lord your God, he says verse 5. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. And this live in them is the same as the resurrection spoken of in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. Those who take part in that first resurrection have eternal life. That's what we're talking about here. And God's saying, if you do my statutes and my judgments and, and live that way, you will live. And that means eternal life. What's the alternative? Death. Verse 6. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him. To uncover their nakedness, I am the Lord. Again, how many times, I am the Lord. He's making his case very strong here. Now, there's a lot of confusion 
among preachers, teachers, whatever, uh, concerning what it means to uncover one's nakedness. And let's clear that up right out of the gate. Uh, turn with me, you're not gonna have this on your monitor. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11, just one or two pages over in your Bible. Just one verse there, so hold your place. Leviticus 20, verse 11. And the man that lieth with his father's wife, this is specific in the Hebrew, it means his stepmother, otherwise it would say his mother, hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now, this, uh, unfortunately, the misunderstanding of what it means to uncover one's father's Father's nakedness uh, is used by a lot of different religions, churches, to teach that in Genesis chapter 9 that that was the origination of our black brothers and sisters in Christ. What a bunch of hooey. <laughs> to uncover one's father's nakedness means to sleep with his wife. In other words, Ham slept with Noah's wife, his own mother, an incestuous relationship which resulted in the conception of Canaan. And therefore, Noah, being very aggravated about the whole situation, put the curse on Canaan. It wasn't God that put a curse on Canaan. Many teach it was God that cursed them, and that curse was that he turned their skin black, and which is and, and to think that in, in the result of an incestuous relationship, you have Noah, who is Adamic, you have uh, his son Ham, uh, who is Adamic, Noah's wife certainly Adamic, and they have a child, the Ham and his mother, and that turn an incestuous relationship turns the color of the skin. I don't think so. So let's get real about this. We're talking about uncovering someone's nakedness means lying with them in, in the act of intercourse. Verse 7. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. And for in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, when a man and a wife join, uh, they become what? And they become one flesh. So if you uncover one's nakedness, obviously you uncover the other's nakedness. Verse 8. The nakedness of thy father's wife, again in the Hebrew, very specific, uh, this means uh, your stepmother, shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. And this uh, law also extended to concubines. Uh, for example, sometimes, and, and there was no prohibition at this time against a man having more than one wife. Uh, and many had many wives and many concubines. As I uh, mentioned just a few moments ago, um, uh, Solomon had over 600, 700 wives and concubines. And how he kept up with that, I will never know know. Uh, but uh, again, this would uh, defile the father's bed by him, the, the, the one sleeping with his wife, uh, whether that be stepmother or mother. Okay, I think we'll stop there for today and pick this up in our next lecture. Uh, we'll see that uh, many different relatives and also non-relatives will be off limits, as we'll see. And also, when we get to chapter 20, we'll learn what the various punishments are for lying with a relative, and they vary depending on which relative it is. Anywhere from the penalty, as we saw when we went to chapter 20, verse 11, uh, for the definition of uncovering one's nakedness, uh, they were to be stoned to death. That was the worst penalty, obviously. Uh, other penalties range from bearing their own iniquity, meaning God chooses the punishment, to being childless uh, to no punishment for one of them, as we'll see. But anyway, we're going to stop there for today. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment. Our Father truly loves you. I love you because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. But what's really important, He loves you for that. It really makes His day. And I want you to know that I appreciate you. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, Bless God, know what? He will always bless you. 
But there's one thing that's more important than anything else. That's this, that you stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with problems. You know why? Jesus is the living word. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.